Good afternoon, sir. Yo, yo. This is episode 63 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your host, Brett and CH. Today's topics, uh, bottle pay, one of my favorite um, Bitcoin applications is closing its doors. So we're going to talk a little bit about regulation and how that stifles um, innovation and specifically Bitcoin innovation. Also, um, recent news, turns out Vitalik and uh, the Ethereum Foundation had dumped their bags at the top back in 2017, uh, which is, is recent news. So we'll talk about that. And additionally, uh, the consensus offices in India and one other country, I forget which one, um, the Philippines are are closing their doors. So it looks like, um, you know, the, the show doesn't always last forever here. And the malinvestment of the, the crypto space is starting to starting to show itself. But how are you doing this week, man? I'm doing good. Uh, it's just, you know, I think there's the selling the top thing. Right? I think we we can delve into that pretty good, but the the bottle play thing we I was discussing before with you, and then I was like, wait, we should start recording before I like start we start ranting on it. Um, yep. This whole bottle play thing is pretty interesting. They're shutting down basically because of a EU regulation because it's based out of the United Kingdom, um, because of KYC AML, which is know your customer and anti money laundering laws, which in reality are really a giant joke because like as we've seen for the past few decades, like large banks like i'm just gonna use hsbc for instance have laundered hundreds of millions of dollars for cartels with getting and all that comes out of it is they get a slap on the wrist no one goes to jail no one gets in trouble no one gets fired and things go on like cartels had in mexico like their hsbc branch had specific like windows where the cartel could put briefcases through so they could put their money you know into the bank and obviously it would get laundered um, again, and then as you, you and I were discussing, people were sending, you know, pennies, if not a few bucks at most over um, this bottle pay service. And it's like, wh- what do you think they're going to they're going to buy a nuclear weapon with like three dollars? Come on. It's, it's a joke. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And it's funny to see how uh, the same business models are are changing over time and ad- adopting newer technology. So. Um, just for those that don't know, Bottle Pay was basically just a tipping service that runs over social media. So if you were on Twitter and somebody said something uh, witty or whatever, you could say, you know, Bottle Pay, send person A uh, 100 sats, and it would go ahead and allocate 100 sats to them from from your Lightning wallet, and uh, Bottle Pay ran out everything custodially so they were they were taking care of all the back end functions and um, it it's cool to see how bottle pay was uh, leveraging lightning to make the tipping service um, usable right and prior to this uh, the last tipping service that was on social media was called change tip I believe the difference was is that it was all on chain now that didn't matter back in the day because um, Bitcoin wasn't worth anything and the transaction fees nobody was really thinking about it it was it was you know pennies at most uh, even less than that so it it's cool to see how the technology allows business models to adapt but at the same time we're seeing bottle pay decide that they're not going to comply with the I think it's called 5 AMLD EU regulation, which would basically require them to KYC AML every single person that uses the the service. And, you know, I find it it's pretty admirable of them to just say, you know, fuck you, we're not going to do it. Um, and they're going to shut their shut their doors. So I, I give them a lot of credit for, I guess, doing like the, the cypherpunk, uh, you know, thing and just shut your doors and decide not to comply. Um, whether or not that was the best idea that I'm sure they could have changed their jurisdictions, but I mean the the KYC AML is really starting to creep into things here and and I think it's important to to bring up just the topic how regulation will always stifle innovation regardless if it's around Bitcoin, regardless if it's around uh, energy production or or just businesses in general. It really really gets in the way of creating new businesses because it it raises the cost to do business right how much was it going to cost uh bottle pay to kyc aml every single person it's just it, it, it it's impossible yeah it, it really just it shuts down like when you're talking about early startups or you know new businesses where 
having you know you have tight budgets it just it's tough and it allows you know older legacy industries that have you know large prof- profit already and you know deep pockets it's much easier and we see this with a lot of um new tech and you obviously the, like i remember when even when i was early in crypto it was like the kyc aml was not there like very few exchanges and it really really picked up you know as 2017 went on obviously by 2018 most exchanges it was a lot more strict and you know but early 2017 there was not that much kyc aml <laughs> yeah no it was it was it was great and it's hard because that's the way it should be right yeah. it, it, we really there's no need to store and handle everybody's information um, I, I understand that the main reason that a normie would say, well, of course we need to take people's identity is because they're worried about things like tax evasion or they've been convinced that um, money laundering and terrorism is is the main reason that you need to perform KYC AML. And that's just, it's honestly just not true and very, very, very rarely is the case. And I'm hoping that we see uh, more businesses push back on this and start to to move to other jurisdictions. And that was kind of my question to you. You know, you take BitMEX as a fantastic example of a, of a Bitcoin company, or let's just say company of the future that's doing things correctly, where they're not taking your personal information and they're providing an excellent service um, to the marketplace that you can, you can speculate on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And, And I, and they decided to pick up and move their business to Hong Kong because um, from a regulatory standpoint, it was much more friendly to them. So, do you think we're gonna we're gonna see more um, businesses, regardless if it's Bitcoin or not, just start to move to friendlier jurisdictions? It's inevitable, and we see it with the smaller countries um, like Gibraltar, a lot of the um, you know Bahamas, Puerto Rico is a perfect example. A lot of people who did really well in crypto moved to Puerto Rico. You know, at the you know, end of 2017, 2018, for reasons of taxes and other things, um, and just the friendliness of uh, regulation. And I'm sure there's I'm sure there's other small countries that I'm not thinking of on the tip like of my tongue. Malta, Malta, exact Malta, that just are tiny, where it kind of empowers them to you know get ahead of the curve here. Be like, okay, we're a small body, let's move ahead of these larger countries that are going to take years and years and years to come around to this right because what it is is it's internet money and obviously the internet is huge now and it is everything we do and without the internet everything we do right now would stop it would halt i couldn't imagine if like the internet i mean <laughs> i don't know it's true it's true like if the internet wasn't working for a day in the u.s it would be sheer chaos insta models would probably be hanging themselves there'd be no business going on i mean you just, it's it, it'd be all over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People try to say that the internet hasn't touched everything, and it, and it I, really has. I when have, you step I can't back think and of when you step anything. back and think about it, um, both money and the internet now touch pretty much every single person on the planet's life every day on a daily basis for everything that they do. Yeah. We couldn't record this podcast if we didn't have the internet. Um, we couldn't send each other memes if we didn't have the internet. <laughs> Shit. There, 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 I mean, and even just, you know, think about it from your personal banking perspective, um, from the television that you watch, uh, making phone calls, everything's kind of done over the internet now. And it allows for um, global scalability. So it it is interesting how they've tried to now when i say they i just mean um the state and regulations in general really try to take control over that because you know they really just want their cut that's all and i i think hopefully over you know the years to come people really start to fight back and push back against this this kyc aml nonsense because it really just no nobody gains at all and there's very, very, very little downside, if any, to uh, getting getting rid of this. But uh, you know, it's just the whole point is to make sure we're educating everybody on regulatory capture and just how how terrible that is from a, from a business standpoint because it doesn't allow new entrants to come into the marketplace and compete with incumbents because the cost of compliance is just fucking massive. Yeah, no, and you, you're 100 percent right. Night when you talk about, as I said earlier, just companies that are running a tight budget, you know, where you have you know a handful of employees, where you, you know you just have enough capital just to get by, 
And then when you, when you throw crushing regulations like KYC AML, and then you have to hire more people, other compliance officers, you name it, it just becomes a shit show. Yeah, it's it's a complete shit show. And I, I really hope that companies like BitMEX thrive and just make so much money that everybody starts to point to them and and look at them as a good actor in the space. Maybe they're going to, I don't know, donate funds to good causes or fund developers and all this stuff. Like, you really want to paint these people in a, in a good light because they're the next... Um, unicorn type companies or backbone of the you know that parallel financial system that we keep talking about um and everybody really needs to fight for their privacy and and their rights because if not then you know we're just going to keep giving up our freedoms here and it's just not not a good thing but i think that's why bitcoin exists and uh you know nobody nobody was talking about privacy a couple of years ago and now it's top of mind and you know i think this space is a good um there, it's just a good partnership. Just the Bitcoin space and you know taking back your privacy. They they really go hand in hand. So I think it's a it's a good match for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, and then again, I remind people, Bitcoin's not private. It's just a pseudonymous public ledger. So if you can attach a face to a uh, address, people know who it is. Kind of like right. kind of like Hex with Richard Hart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the nice. privacy thing, that's a really good point. It's, you know, if we didn't have KYC AML, we'd really have that pseudonymity aspect wouldn't wouldn't be as big of a deal. But because we have KYC AML, now there's much more of a need for um, more privacy features to be built so that, um, you know, it, you know, Bitcoin can be used in a more private manner. And, uh, you know, it sucks that it's gotten to that point. But you know what? That's just, it is what it is. You got to play the hand you're dealt and pick up the fucking sticks and keep pushing the, moving the ball down the court, you know? Yeah. Uh, you want to dabble into the uh, Vitalix on the top? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I came across this recently, and this is the first time I'm, I'm hearing about this. Uh, you know, Vitalik Buterin was recently interviewed on Eric Weinstein's podcast, and he, I don't know if he meant to say this, but he, he, he was telling the truth that, the Ethereum Foundation had unloaded 70,000 ETH um, basically at the top. And this started making the rounds on Twitter and was being sent around to everybody. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's hysterical because if the Ethereum, Ethereum Foundation would have said at the end of 2017 or early 2018 that they, they had unloaded a decent sized position on retail investors' heads. Um, perhaps those retail investors would not still have been buying hand over fist at the time, and they would have, they would have taken a step back and said, "Hmm, maybe, maybe mm. I shouldn't be doing this." Right? And you know, <laughs> it's just, it's just a really good example of you know the saying like, "Watch what they do, not what they say." Yeah. Um, and and you know, it took me a long time to kind of learn that lesson as I was fomoing and buying tops and and you know really getting myself into a bad situation and now it's two years later and we find out they were they were dumping their bags um i i don't wonder if you know the the eth heads are having second thoughts now that they know that their lord and savior uh pretty much dumped on them our lord and savior vitalik yeah i mean here's my 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 two cents on it is like do you blame them i mean the price of Ethereum that you're going from like eight bucks to fifteen hundred basically, and it obviously depends on the exchange you're looking at. Um, because there was that Kamichi, was it Kamichi Premium or whatever in Korea where it was like yeah. eighteen hundred or nineteen hundred. Um, but anyways, I don't think you can blame them. I think you know for them to do it, you know whether you agree or disagree, as a business, it's a smart thing to do. They need they need you know, I think everyone who like when you talk about ICOs or businesses that were in crypto who held crypto, you know, from, you know, whatever their starting point was in 2017 or 2016 and rode at the top and didn't sell shit was, was, a was a terrible idea. And that wrecked so many ICOs that had tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions in funding and watched it dwindle down, you know, 80% instead of just sitting in fiat because sitting in fiat, you're going to miss out. Was do you, I mean I remember everyone bitching about that like oh you right. you know you're gonna miss out and it's like no 
you're going to sit in something that isn't going to lose 85% of its value over the next 300 days. Right. No, it's it's a good point. And, you know, on one hand, I bring it up because I like trashing Ethereum. But on the other hand, you're you're absolutely correct. You cannot you cannot blame anybody for, um, you know, making a profit. And the only thing I think that frustrates me as someone who was very new to the space at the time is I, I think I would have enjoyed a little transparency there. Like I, oh, I, I would have. I think if we'd I would known, have, if I would we'd have known Vitalik that. dumped fucking 30 million in Ethereum, uh, he, maybe like dump everything <laughs> dump every right. erc20 token you own yeah it, it, things would have been much much different and uh you know it's important to also remember we were just talking about regulation we don't need any additional regulation to learn from these mistakes people learn a financial lesson and they can choose not to get burned the next time around so you and I might be telling the people who are coming into the space the next time around, you better be really careful because people will dump their bags on you. So, you know, we don't need any additional regulation to protect the consumer. Uh, that's that's just a big joke. It very rarely, if ever, protects the consumer. I mean, people are, are allowed to go and spend millions of dollars on lottery tickets and never win. So, <laughs> there you go. I, like, that's you know, a that's a great example. That's, that, Nobody, nobody needs it. Everybody's an adult, and believe me, you you touch the stove while it's hot, and you get burned. You won't touch it again, and uh, that's where um, a lot of this stuff just makes sense. And I think I saw another. We were sending each other those uh, snapshots of like Matic. I don't remember some shit coin that just got absolutely oh, Matt, it, it was Matic. And uh, somebody had somebody had uh, posted on Reddit that they lost like fifty percent of their life savings in Matic and then uh, they decided to gamble on Binance on and use leverage and they lost the rest of their Bitcoin like trying to revenge trade and, and make all their make all their money back and yeah. now they basically have nothing and um, revenge trading does not work yeah no revenge trading doesn't work and I think it's a good thing to just to touch on very quickly that uh, a lot of people who get into this and get the excitement of trading um, will end up doing something like this because it just gets way too emotional for them. And, uh, you know, people get burned, but I can guarantee you this person, I don't know if their, their thread was real or not, if it actually did happen, but I know it did happen to a lot of people and it, it really sucks to see. Yeah. I mean, and even if you bought from the very beginning of that run, you know, at the end of November, it, it took a day two days you know tops and i think if i remember correctly it happened in a few it took like it wasn't long like the reason it shows like two daily candlesticks is because it happened right at the end of one daily candlestick it was like, really fast yeah. yeah so this is a 15 minute stick and it went from 465 sats to 156 or 150 at the low basically <laughs> in like 45 minutes something like that you know that's so, insane yeah yeah no it, that's absolutely mind-boggling that's you know losing over 60 percent of its value in less than an hour um and it's just a friendly reminder that crypto is still very dangerous and it's not something to be you know deal with lightly dabbling in shit coins or bitcoin in general is just dangerous right no yeah it's, it, it is a good I mean, point we've seen bitcoin drop like fucking 15 percent in you know an hour you know it can right. happen yeah i mean you need to um, with any of this stuff, it, I, I like to tell people if it's money that you're willing to lose, then maybe you can you can roll the dice. I don't think about that as much from a Bitcoin perspective, just since it's it's been a few years now for me, and I I think I've learned a lot, so I consider it like a very long term savings vehicle. But at the same time, there could be a catastrophic bug. Uh, it could it could go to zero by the time I wake up tomorrow, and like you need to be willing. Uh, to live with that, and I, I'm pretty sure I've made peace with that in the in the uh, low probability scenario that that does happen. But everybody has to come to their own terms with that. And you know, with the shitcoin stuff, I've just I've seen and know too many people who have really gotten burned who thought that they were an oracle of like calling the next um, the next big things, and they just really lost their shit. Live by the sword, die by the sword, as we spoke about last podcast. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> oh, man. it's You know, it's one of those things, again, it's like 
you know, the, the future here is just so hard to predict because there's so many, as we talked about last podcast, it feels like everything's converging on this point. It doesn't matter, like, if it's, you're talking about, like, um, politics, macro, geopolitics, finance, crypto, you name it, it's all converging here at, at some weird point. Um, it'll be interesting to see where crypto all fits in this too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is definitely the interesting part. Um, you know, speaking of the Ethereum Foundation, you know, selling the top and getting a what a hundred or so million bucks uh, in the bank to fund their development. Looks like that funding of development might be coming to an end here as consensus is shutting down their offices in India and the Philippines. Um, while I don't think this is humongous news i think it it's just another puzzle piece to the big puzzle that you know you and i have been talking about over the mm-hmm. last year and just how the malinvestment spreads in times of easy money and consensus made a shitload of easy money after pre-mining a coin uh giving themselves a shitload of it and then dumping their bags on retail uh you can afford to fund some development for quite a few years and it looks like that funding is finally starting to uh either dry up or they realize that they need to they need to conserve their balance sheet a little bit more to get themselves through the rest of the bear market however long that might be um and it's just it's showing that these offices are just unprofitable business ventures that are you know they're not making any money it's not like they're self-sustaining or anything this is somebody's got to write a check every month to keep the lights on at the at that place and pay everybody who's working there so you know, my question to you when when we see this kind of thing happen is, do you think since, you know, the Bitcoin and crypto space just moves so much faster than everything else, is is it a leading indicator of just things to happen or things to come with the overall economy? I think it is. And I think we, we, we already saw it. What was it? It wasn't too long ago. I don't know if we talked about the podcast. Was it? Um, Morgan Stanley or is it JP Morgan that cut a bunch of jobs? Yep, one of them cut like a, 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 a good a good chunk of people. Um, and I think again, as you just mentioned, the, the crypto moves faster, and that obviously that crypto has basically been completely wiped out and completely dead, even despite the huge Bitcoin rally and major altcoins. I would say because like Litecoin five x from the December lows to June highs. Um, it's we're it's still dead in terms of new funding coming in and interest i mean when you think about 2016 2017 really um the amount of people just throwing money at crypto was absolutely absurd i mean everyone was throwing they were throwing money at anything any ico was getting money it was it was in september it was like there was like five new icos every day launching while there was yep. already dozens of icos that were open accepting funding and people were filling them up the the basic attention token bat which is part of um the brave browser that thing in 30 seconds filled up it's like 30 million dollar um funding it was you know it's it's absurd and when we you know look back on it how speculative everything was you know, I mean, I'm guilty. I was like, holy shit, you know, and I, and I think when we get close to the top, I started to realize that this wasn't, you know, going to stay around. But even like in the summer of 2017 and even into the early fall, it was like, holy shit, this is actually going to happen. And <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, you're, you're right. I, uh, I, I underestimated how quickly the space would move and I overestimated um, the adoption of, you know, just Bitcoin in general with the rest of the market and everything else. And it, it, it's so cyclical and it's so emotionally driven that, you know, and you and I always talk about price driving adoption, but it's never been more true when you take a step back and look at the qualitative, um, emotional state of everybody in the space nobody's talking about bitcoin anymore it's no. dead even though it's up a hundred percent from the lows of the year nobody gives a shit it's the best performing asset of the last decade and has the highest uh, sharp ratio of any asset class nobody gives a shit like that doesn't it doesn't even matter to anybody it might matter to you and me um, but nobody else really cares and rightfully so maybe they shouldn't because it's not 
big enough for them to be interested enough to put their career on the line to say maybe we should have a very small allocation of bitcoin in in our portfolio and financial advisors are recommending to their their baby boomer clients to put bitcoin in their portfolio it's just not going to happen and emotionally i can see it just from running some of the social media pages and stuff like that it's just it's very dead right now but that also makes me really bullish because there's a lot more um technological things that are happening in the background and businesses being built up that will help fuel us come next bull market like take cash app as an example uh i don't think we're going to have to worry about onboarding new people into the system because no, cash apps already that's humongous. As easy as it gets i mean this is I, I mean you and i remember trying to help friends and family oh sign dude, up for coinbase or anything else and you just couldn't get on and now you're going to be able to onboard millions of people without any hesitation this next time around. So that's where I get really excited because things can get crazy pretty fast. Yeah, I like I remember like trying to even like Coinbase obviously is the easiest option, but I told people to avoid it because the fees and other things among that. And um, so I would like oh I would tell people to go use Bitstamp because um, I like the Bitstamp a lot, and if, especially towards you know. Um, the only down to the bit stamp was if you're in the US it's international so funding it was tough and using it if you used a debit card or credit card to buy the fees were pretty high so but I liked bit stamp and like still it's like I know how to navigate exchange and go place an order but for the average person that was like a nightmare and it, I mean it didn't take much effort but people didn't want to do it and it was like when you had friends asking about it or like people you know hitting you up for it you're like you're like if you can't even like Google search or just figure this out yourself, how how the hell am I gonna you know do anything? I'm not gonna you know I wasn't gonna go assist every person in buying crypto, right? You know because obviously there, there was a lot of people towards the end of 2017 that were just piling in, and Coinbase was obviously the easiest option, but they're you know they were limited in their amount of shit coins, and that was kind of a bummer because you know a lot of the people didn't get those um. 30 or 40 baggers in December because <laughs> because they were fucking they limited to Litecoin yeah. and Ethereum. Yeah. Oh, I only got a 5x shit or like Bitcoin when, you know, so they only doubled their money. They didn't get the they didn't get the fucking feeling of 30 or 40 or 50x. <laughs> yeah, um, they couldn't they didn't feel the euphoria. They didn't feel it cuz um Kraken, I think Kraken just completely broke down in like the end of November. I remember trying to sign into Kraken and it just wasn't working. And it didn't work all December, and it didn't work until end like middle of January, basically after everything peaked. So I had completely stopped using Kraken at that point. And I actually I like Kraken a lot now. Um, I, yeah, I, I like Kraken as well. I really do, and I like what they stand for. They told the uh, Bit license to fuck off. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I like, and they're based out of Seattle, if I remember correctly. I, I could have sworn they were based out of San Francisco because I know there's an office over there, but I'm pretty sure it's the West Coast. Either it's, way, I mean, either way. their CEO is a fucking stud. He uh, is not a huge fan of the state, which I I like. I like to see that in, in, in my CEOs. I like to see uh, that. It's a, high, so, it's a quality I look for. Yeah, big time. Uh, what do you think? That's a good way to wrap this one up. Yeah, that's a good way to wrap it up. Yeah, no, this was a good one. Um, you know, so this was episode 63 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Spotify. Shoot us a DM and let us know what you want us to talk about. We do appreciate that. And, uh, you know, just be careful out there and stack sats. Peace.